Good morning. Welcome to Lockwood Community Church. Hope you've had a great weekend and excited to come and worship the Lord this morning. Let's join together as we read the call to worship this morning, found from 1 Peter and Psalms. Read with me, please. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let's enter his presence with thanksgiving. Let's shout triumphantly to him in song. So let's stand together as we sing, Worship Christ the Risen King. Rise, O church, and lift your voices. Christ has conquered death and hell. Sing as all the earth rejoices, resurrection anthem swell. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the risen King. Hear the Protest and tremble, see the stone removed with power. All hell's minions may assemble, but cannot withstand his hour. He has conquered, he has conquered, Christ the Lord, the risen King. We acclaim your life. O oh, Jesus, now we sing your victory. Sin or hell may seek to seize us, but your conquest keeps us free. Stand in triumph, stand in triumph, worship Christ the risen King. May be seated. Let's pray together. We confess that Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead and will with him raise us. With that kind of confidence, we come before you, holy God, not in our sins, but in the righteousness that you have made available to us through your Son, Jesus. We come in hope, and we come to worship you. Or we'll fail at that unless you help us by your Spirit. Please help us by your Spirit now. Focus our minds. Help us to release our worries and see you high and lifted up. And I ask for this in the name of your Son, who is Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Hear this reading from Isaiah 57 through 10. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore have I set my face like flint, and know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the sovereign Lord who helps me. Who is he that will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment. The moss will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant? Let him who walks in the dark who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on him, God. Let's sing again, Jesus shall reign. shall reign where'er the sun does his 
successive journeys run, his kingdom spread from shore to shore, till moon shall wax and wane no more. To him shall endless prayer be made, and endless praises crown his head. His name shall bleed, perfume shall rise with every morning sacrifice. Let every creature rise and bring his grateful Matthew 14, 25 through 31. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, crying out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You a little faith, he said. Why do you doubt? Please stand with us and worship. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene And wonder how he could love me A sinner condemned unclean And oh how marvelous, oh how wonderful And my song shall end sins and my sorrows he made them his very own and bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone oh how marvelous oh how wonderful and my song shall joy through the ages to sing of his love for me oh how marvelous oh how wonderful and my song shall ever be oh how marvelous oh how wonderful is my Savior's love for me God sent his they called him Jesus, he came to love, kill and forget, he lived and died to find Yeah. 
Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. All the hope is in you. All the hope is in you. All the glory to you. Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin. Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, and Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. Man, you can have a seat. If you look at your bulletin, you'll find a prayer panel with requests for this week. Would you pray for those requests during this week? And let's pray for them right now. If you can think of a way to help these folks, go for it. Let's do it. And let's pray right now. We remind ourselves, Lord, in your presence, that you are aware of what's going on not just from a distance, but you are with your people. You send us out, but then you go with us. And so we know that you know about the things that are going on in our friends' lives. Would you let them know that too? Would you take away their fear and anxiety would you miraculously give them your peace? Not the way the world gives, but peace that doesn't even make sense in some situations, and yet is true and real. Would you send us to help them in whatever way you'd like? Give us ideas. Put them on, on our minds and in our hearts and enable us to act on them. Help us to love each other well. And Lord, would you do for them what needs to be done in ways that will bring you glory? We not only pray for us, but for your church everywhere, and especially in our community. May our brothers and sisters experience your love and love each other well. And now would you speak to us through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in John chapter 20 today. <clears throat> I'm going to read for us verses 14 through 19. I hope you've already had a chance to read this. If you don't get the get ready for Sunday email that tells you, here's the passage we're going to be looking at, read it before you come, That'll be help, that will help you be prepared. Uh, call the office and say, I want to get that. And, and then you can read, and when you come here, you're already ready for what the Lord might want to say to us. Uh, verse 14. A week later, and this is a week after the resurrection, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out, put your hand into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, 
because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. My nephew and his wife are deconstructing their faith. I like my nephew. He's a smart, sorry to say smart kid, but he's a smart, thoughtful, late 30s man. Um, his parents are Christians. His grandpa is a Baptist pastor. Two of his uncles are in the ministry. And now he, according to his mom, the Baptist pastor's daughter, is deconstructing his faith. Now, to deconstruct is not the same thing as to demolish. He still believes in Jesus. The last time I spoke to his mom, which is a while ago now, almost a year ago, uh, he was still involved in church. From what I understand, and I hope I'm not misrepresenting him, his doubts have driven him to dismantle his belief system and discard what he no longer believes. I don't know when his doubts started, but I suspect it was years ago maybe decades ago. My nephew's part of a great company of people who are deconstructing their faith. There is a lot of doubt out there and in here, in the American church. Yet in the church, at least in some churches, it's common to act as if doubt, like alcoholism and porn addiction, doesn't exist among us. It's something that we simply can't bring ourselves to acknowledge. Doubt is not sin. Though sin, our own or someone else's, can often lead to doubt. It's not sin, but it's a terrible inconvenience. It is a painful experience, and it is a symptom that something isn't right. Pretending we don't have doubts is not helpful. And yet many people have been taught to be ashamed of their doubts, terrified to admit them, and thereby helpless to do anything about them. If you're one of those people, I hope today's message will help you trust God and us enough to face your doubts and to deal with them. My nephew, if I understand correctly, and I may not, I haven't spoken to him, became aware of the fact that some of the things that he had learned from his parents and his church conflicted with other things that he now accepts as true. I suspect that that realization took time, probably years. But doubts don't always come that way. Sometimes they don't grow within us, but they assault us from without. The, the moral failure of a revered Christian leader shocks us and we start to doubt. Or the frightening diagnosis that the doctor gives us trips us up. Or the apostasy of someone who seemed our superior in every way pulls the theological rug right off from under our feet. The Apostle Thomas's doubts did not arise out of a growing dissonance of conflicting beliefs. One day he rested easy in the faith. The next day he was drowning in doubt. Whether doubts arise slowly or attack without warning, the, the way Jesus dealt with Thomas in his doubts can instruct us and encourage us. So let's get into the story. On Resurrection Sunday, Mary Magdalene returns from the tomb earlier in the day with news that Jesus is alive. She has talked to him. She didn't hear some mysterious oracle coming from the sky or dream a dream or see a vision. She had a conversation with Jesus. And then a little later, other women began coming in with a similar message. Jesus is alive. They talked about angels. They talked about seeing him. And the apostles thought they're out of their minds. In fact, the term that Luke uses was an old medical one to describe the wild ramblings of someone in delirium. And then Peter came back to the upper room and told the others that he had seen Jesus. Peter was not delirious. 
for the first time, the disciples began to think there might be something to all this talk that Jesus is alive. And then Cleopas and his companion, very possibly his wife, pounded on the door with news that they had seen Jesus. They had walked with him for several miles, had a conversation with him on the road to Emmaus. Now, the text does not say that Thomas was present for all of this or any of it. If he was, I can imagine that he didn't take it well. The idea that someone who was executed by crucifixion before thousands of witnesses could return to life three days later was just nonsense as far as he could tell. So Thomas is the kind of guy who wants to face facts. Give it to me straight. That was his attitude. He wasn't the kind of person who sugarcoated the truth. So you remember in John chapter 11, Jesus is about to return to Jerusalem, and the disciples try to talk him out of it. Thomas says, huh, let's also go with him, that we may die with him. That was Thomas. If he had been there when the report started coming in that Jesus had been seen, I can imagine him getting angry and walking out. However that happened, Thomas was not there when what happened next happened. Jesus suddenly appeared in the middle of them all and greeted them with the words, Peace be with you. And he showed him his hands and his side. Only John tells us that he showed them his side. And undoubtedly, that's the mark where the spear had gone in. Luke explains that the disciples were terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. So Jesus showed them his scars and as Luke tells us, asked for a piece of fish and ate it in front of them. Because ghosts don't have scars. And ghosts don't eat fish. And then Jesus said, again, peace be with you. That really struck me this week as I read it. He only had to say peace once to the raging storm. And it grew still. But to the raging disciples so full of fear and doubt. It took two times. We humans are his most troublesome work, but he thinks us worth it. Let's not be surprised if the storm that's brewing and breaking out in our souls requires Jesus to say peace more than once. And let's learn that when storms of fear and doubt assail us, the one voice we most need to hear is his. And we can rush to the internet and we can do all the research, and, but you know who we need to hear from? Him. Jesus then breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. This is highly symbolic. I think there's no question that John wants us to see that the new creation has begun. You need to understand that John composed his gospel in a way that shows us that God is doing it again. We see a new creation brought into being, as was the first creation, through God's word. Remember how John started his gospel? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him, nothing was made. That, the very first verse, John is putting us on notice that this is about God's work of creation. Now at the end of the gospel, John shows us the creation of the new humanity. As God breathed breath the breath of life into the first man. Jesus now breathes the breath of life, and breath and spirit are the same word in Greek and in Aramaic and in Hebrew. He's breathing the breath of life into the people of the new creation. While this new creation is being enacted before our eyes, they are not all there because Thomas is missing. And when he comes back, we don't know what he was doing. Perhaps he's out blowing off steam. Mm -hmm. He's even more upset by all of this confounded nonsense. 
Thomas is the group's skeptic. Sometimes I think every group needs a skeptic to keep them from believing things that aren't true. I like skeptics, and I think they're important. Years ago, I subscribed to the magazine. I was probably the only pastor who subscribed to this magazine, The Skeptical Inquirer. I quit taking it because I didn't find it skeptical enough. I was expecting rigorous thought across the board, and what I found was a kind of selective skepticism that was unquestioning and uncritical of its own assumptions. That may describe Thomas as well, as we'll see shortly. When he came back to the upper room, now, we don't actually know that this was the upper room. The, the text never says so. We assume that it is, but skeptical inquirer, you know, perhaps it was another place. When he comes back and finds everyone giddy and gushing about Jesus being alive, every skeptical bone in his body ached. People don't die and get buried and then unbury themselves three days later. That doesn't happen. We may wonder why Thomas, a Jew who believed firmly in the resurrection of the dead, couldn't believe that Jesus had been resurrected, even when his friends were telling them they'd seen him. But think about this. Every Jew knew what the resurrection was. And this wasn't it. The resurrection was not one solitary individual coming back to life. It was everyone who had ever lived coming back to life. And that had not happened. And no one, not Thomas, not any of the others, supposed that it had. See, one of the extraordinary things about the Gospels, which no one seems to notice, is that not a single disciple of Jesus ever speaks of his return to life as a resurrection. That is powerful evidence for the reliability of the gospel record. Now, by the time the gospels were written, we're talking 20 years later, and, and even after that, all of the writers associated what had happened to Jesus with the resurrection. But when it happened, none of Jesus' closest followers did. They all, except Thomas, believed that Jesus was somehow alive again, but none of them thought of that as resurrection. It would take meeting with Jesus and many hours of instruction for them to understand the connection of what had happened to him with the resurrection of the dead. Right now, all they know is Jesus is alive. They are so excited, everyone is speaking at once. And with every word, Thomas is more unyielding in his skepticism. I think that Thomas didn't want to believe, or rather, he didn't dare to believe. He had believed that Jesus is the Messiah. He spent three years of his life following Jesus. He didn't marry, didn't work a job, left everything to follow Jesus, and what it had gotten him? Despair, desolation, anguish. He wasn't going to let that happen again. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Thomas was not going to be fooled twice. His skepticism, and I suspect all skepticism, was rooted in disappointment and maintained for the sake of safety. Look at what he says, this is verse 25. Unless I see the marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe it. In Greek, I will not believe is emphatic because of a double negative. It's something like, I will not, I will not believe it. Thomas has set his conditions for belief, and they're stringent. He requires redundant proof. He must see. He must feel. He, he demands both visual and tactile proof not just of Jesus' hands, but also of his side. Thomas would have made a good scientist. Right at home with double-blind tests and the repeatability of result requirements. Let me ask you, have you ever, when you were completely certain of something, 
had someone doubt you or tell you straight out that you were wrong? If so, I bet it tested your humility. When you're absolutely sure and someone doubts or even contradicts you, it feels like they think you're stupid. feels like disrespect. And I suppose that's both how Thomas felt and the other disciples. There must have been a lot of tension between them for the rest of that week. The others must have thought, what? You think we're stupid or something? You're the only one who knows anything? How they must have wanted Jesus to prove himself, and frankly, to prove them to Thomas. Likewise, Thomas must have been equally defensive. Don't tell me I'm wrong. I know what I know. I know that dead people, crucified dead people, don't come out of their graves after three days. I'd have to be stupid to think otherwise. That's how I think Thomas and the other disciples must have felt all week long. But think of how Jesus must have felt. His apostle, whom he'd chosen, refused to believe in him. His friend, for whom he died, continued to doubt him. Millions of people doubt Jesus today. Across our country, untold numbers of people are like my nephew deconstructing their faith. They are doubting what they've been taught, and sometimes with really good reason. But some are also doubting the one about whom they've been taught. They're doubting Jesus. How does he feel about that? Does he get his back up over that? Does it make him angry? You know, people who get angry when they're doubted get angry because they're insecure. Jesus is not insecure. He doesn't feel a need to prove himself or to show people up. He doesn't get angry when people doubt and question him. He didn't get angry with Thomas or the rest of the disciples, for that matter, because you realize, don't you, that the others didn't believe either when they were told? When the women told them they had seen Jesus, they said, you're delirious. Just like Thomas, they didn't believe until they saw. Now, let's fast forward one week. They're together in the same room. This time, Thomas is with them. For a week, he's denied everything <clears throat> they've said, but his doubts have not dissuaded them from their belief. Sometimes we make the mistake of trying to argue people out of their doubts. Has that worked for you? It has not worked for me. I, I don't think you can argue people out of their doubts, but hear this. You can believe them into your belief. The, the, be, the best thing that you can do for a doubting friend or family member is to be fully convinced yourself. And by the way, that's why parents shouldn't freak out when their kids experience doubts. When, when your kids see you panicked, that does not increase their faith. It just further erodes it. But if you steadfastly, joyously, and confidently continue to trust God, you will be giving them what they need most from you. Thomas is there, probably sullen, itching for a fight. He won't believe until he sees the nail marks and puts his fingers in them. He won't believe until he puts his hand into Jesus' side where the spear wound is. And then suddenly, Jesus is there. So this is too good not to read. Let me read it. This is verse 26 and verse 27. Though, though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Put your hand into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And I don't doubt that he said that with joyous humor in his voice. Now, the text doesn't say that Thomas put his finger in the nail holes or his hand in Jesus' side. And yet he believed. It wasn't a double-blind result-repeating test that convinced him. 
It was Jesus. It turns out Thomas was not such a skeptic as he thought he was. And I think that is true of many of our friends. We think, oh, they'll never believe. They think they'll never believe. But that can change when Jesus reveals himself to them. That's what we need to ask him to do. And in the meantime, we need to lead such lives of confidence in God that our friends begin to doubt their doubts. Now, let me talk to you. If you are doubting, don't panic. Jesus doesn't hate you because you doubt him. When Thomas doubted, Jesus didn't reproach reproach him, demote him, or kick him out of the apostolic band. He accommodated him. You want to put your fingers here? Bring it over. The the Greek is very uh, visual. Bring your finger over here. Put it right there. He helped him. You, like Thomas, may have doubts and have reasons for them. Perhaps you've been hurt by someone who claimed to love Jesus. And now you doubt that person, and since you doubt them, you find yourself doubting Jesus. Or perhaps something catastrophic has happened, as it happened to Thomas, and you've been shaken. Or maybe doubts have been growing in you for a long time, like my nephew. You may have been taught things that were true, along with things that were not true, and at the time you accepted it all, but now that you know that some of it was false, you've begun to wonder if any of it is true. Whatever is the case, don't panic. You want to know the truth so that you can act on it. God will certainly help you. That's biblical. If putting your finger in his wounds will help, he'll let you do even that. But if your demands for proof are just a reason to continue in unbelief, then you're on your own. Now, before we end, I want to read verses 30 and 31. Let's close out the central section of the book. John has a prologue and epilogue, but the central section ends here in verse 31. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. Uh, Many of them are recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but not in this book. But these, the ones I've selected, are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John's stated goal for writing is to aid people to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, so that they may have life in his name. Why is believing so important? Why doesn't God just give this life to everyone, whether they believe or not? That's a question that has plagued myriads of doubters. If God really is as good as people say that he is, Why wouldn't he just do that? You would do that if you were him. No, you wouldn't. That kind of thinking is based on a misconception. People who say that are thinking of this life, this eternal life, the kind that can live in the new creation. They're thinking of it as something that God can wrap up, put a bow on, and give to a person. But he has no such thing to give. The only thing that God can give a person that will make him or her eternal is himself. When he gives people eternal life, he gives them himself. He will not force himself on people who don't want him. That would undo them, not help them. He woos, he does not ravish. 
He cannot give eternal life to someone who will not have him because he is eternal life and there is no other. That means, as John would later write, that the person who has him has life. And the person who does not have him does not have life. But God offers that life. And when you realize the immensity of this, it's astounding. He offers himself. And he's doing that today. Right now. Through me, will you believe him and receive Jesus to be your life? If you're ready to do that, I want to ask you to come up at the close of our time together. To take hold of the life that is life indeed. Someone will meet with you, pray with you, welcome you to Jesus' side. If you're not quite ready, that's okay. If you need to work through this before you dare to believe, that's good. And if you'd like help with that, call me up. We'll get together, and if I can, I'll answer your questions. And if I can't, I'll be your sounding board. And either way, we'll walk through this journey together. Now let's pray. Lord, I pray for two groups of us today. Those who haven't believed. Maybe have just taken you for granted all this time. Haven't come over to your side. Through trusting and receiving Jesus, your son. Would you help them right now? So we can't do it without you, and I pray that you will help them to say yes to you, to believe on you, to come to your side, to come to Jesus. And the other group I pray for is made of those who have trusted you, but now they're having doubts. Lord, I thank you for them. I pray that even their doubts will turn out to make them stronger in the faith. Would you come to them like you came to Thomas? Lord, they don't need a bunch of answers, but they do need you. And I trust you to do this because you are so good. Lord, I ask for these things in the name of Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Let's stand together and we'll sing. Oh, uh-huh.
be seated. I'm just up here uh, representing the elders today and with an exciting, well, I won't say an announcement, but a reminder of today is a day of prayer that we've set aside. Uh, if you haven't uh, gotten one of uh, these, there are some out uh, in the tables in the back. It gives you several verses in which to uh, read through. Hopefully some of you have been doing that this week. And tonight, we are going to get together as a body of Christ, and we're going to humble ourselves, and we're going to pray. And this is designed for the whole family, so I want to encourage you to come as family units. There will be a time of singing, and then we'll release our children. There will be nursery and age-appropriate lessons on prayer for our kids. And uh, then as adults, uh, we will have uh, uh, several congregational uh, prayers. Then at uh, 7 o'clock, I should say be here at 6.30. I almost forgot that. Then at 7 o'clock, we're going to break down into small groups, three, four, maybe five, six. And uh, we are going to pray for each other. We're going to share our needs. We all have needs. And uh, we're going to share. Now, this is not a gossip time. This is a time to hold each other up in prayer and uh, watch then God go to, go to work. Amen. And then at 720, we're going to come back together. And uh, we are uh, going to pray for uh, restoration of the body and also for unity uh, in a congregational setting. And we'll have some more songs and then a time of sharing of testimonies. What has God done for you? How has God answered your prayers? Folks, get excited about this. Make sure that you got uh, your alarm clock or whatever you need set so that you can be here at 6.30 and bring somebody with you. It's going to be a great time, so hope to see you all. I have a quick announcement for the youth group. Um, if you've never been over to the youth barn, we have a lot of couches inside. The, the barn is carpeted. We have nice couches. It's comfortable for the teens. But when you have those couches for 10 years or so, and you have teenagers jumping on them and everything, they get very junky. And uh, some of them were so junky that when you sat down, you couldn't get out of them. So. We, we took those, there's a big uh, dumpster out there, we threw them away, all the ones that were just terrible. But now we would like some more. Um, we would like some couches that are comfortable, but they don't have to look fancy. Comfortable, nice, and if you have any that you'd like to donate, we could use probably, I don't know, seven or eight or nine couches in there that would be comfortable and nice so that we can make the barn, a place where the teenagers want to be and enjoy. So if you have that, uh, give me a call or call the office or email me and um, we'll try to figure out a way to come pick it up and bring it. Thanks. There are some other announcements and before I forget, I'm going to mention this one. Would you pass the registers? If you haven't done so already, would you do that? And also, before I forget, I, I want to mention that if you have an offering to the Lord, you can place it in the offering plates in the back as you go. So on Easter Sunday, I got pretty wound up, I guess, because I forgot to announce the offering. <laughs> and, and the finance committee has reprimanded me and demoted me <laughs> for that. Uh, I forgot to mention that there are registers to pass and, and go deep sheets to take. So if you want to think through the text we just looked at, John chapter 20, I prepare questions that help you work your way through that text, think through it better. See, a long time ago I realized I'm doing a Sunday morning service sermon, a Sunday, uh, Sunday school class, and then several Bible studies during the week and people are getting information coming from all these different places. What if we kind of focused in on one thing a little bit more? And I think that's hugely helpful 
And so that's why we started Go Deep. Think more deeply about this one text. Get it into you. And one way to do that is to grab a Go Deep sheet and go through it sometime this week with the text in front of you. So I encourage you to do that. They're on the tables right next to the offering place, the cafe tables in the back. There is a congregational forum, a time for the church family to share concerns, and we've had a number of them with, uh, shared with us, so we'll be talking about these things. Uh, for example, should we start passing communion plates? Should we pass the offering plates again? Um, some people say, yeah, we ought to, and, and something the church can talk about. Um, and there are quite a few other things. Should we have a 60-second, hey, let's get acquainted time during Sunday morning? Um, the, and other things as well. That happens on the forum. That's Tuesday night when the family just gets together and we talk about things that are of concern to us at 7 o'clock. So I invite you to come for that. Um, if you haven't got one of the prayer booklets that Mike mentioned, make sure you pick one up. There's a, a help for you to spend a half an hour today in prayer on your own. And if you're part of a nuclear family, to spend a half an hour of prayer with them before we come back together tonight. I encourage you to do that. Look at the tear-off on your bulletin. The Daughters of the King Brunch, if you can help set up, serve, or tear down, would you mark that and, and bless our ladies that way? If you plan on attending, would you mark that and let us know how many people are attending? If you say, I want to know more about being a Christian, and I would encourage you, come up here just in a moment. But if you say, oh, I don't know that I want to do that, you, you can just do this, and we'll get in touch with you, and we can talk together. Or if you have a prayer request, you can put that in the bulletin as well. Now, there are other announcements in here. I think I'll let you read the rest. I'm going to ask you if you'll stand with me for the benediction. <clears throat> Thank you for working in us, Lord. We are your most troublesome work. And you are our most patient, loving, compassionate, and gracious God. We give you thanks in the name of Jesus. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. I'm going to be up here if you want to come up and talk. <laughs>